recording yeah okay yes uh, hello everyone salam namaste adab and welcome um, it is our uh, pleasure to introduce today's host uh, a very visible uh, face in india on social and civil liberties and civil rights uh, activities uh, shabnam hashmi um and uh, i am not going to say beyond this because we have invited a very respectable professor from jamilia islamia uh, dr sonia surabhi gupta uh, who is a professor of international and spanish um, culture and literature uh, and she is a very um, good translator of spanish literature and she is also an activist peace uh, world peace council related to world peace council and all india peace and solidarity organization uh, and she is familiar with shabnam hashmi's work so it would be more appropriate for her uh, rather than me to say uh, in the opening remarks whatever she can say and introduce shabnam hashmi so welcome professor gupta thank you uh, thank you very much it's it's really a pleasure to be uh, you know from india to be on this platform because very soon we are going to celebrate our 72nd republic day in india and it's like you know the day when we actually gave ourselves this constitution which is under such severe attack uh and it is perhaps the right moment to have somebody like shabnam assessing uh, you know uh, and evaluating the current phase of our republic and the quality of our democracy and of course the challenges that face india uh, if anything the events of january 6 in your city have taught us it is precisely the fragility of democracy and the fact that it requires constant political work the kind of work which shabnam has been doing in order to sustain uh, the institutions Uh, which we have created uh, to function on our shared values uh, so despite this un seemingly unstoppable march of india towards a majoritarian uh, nation uh, following an unabashedly neoliberal economic model uh, what is gratifying is uh, that uh, there is a popular resistance uh, just around one year back uh the country had witnessed a citizen upsurge on the question of uh, of of uh, citizenship related laws and today it's the indian farmers who are protesting against the corporatization of our agriculture and in this scenario i think it's a special privilege to be introducing uh shabnam who is the main speaker for today's session because she's uh she's i think just the right person and in fact today she's speaking precisely on the challenges that face us today in india and the role of popular resistance in facing up to these uh, challenges shabnam has been an indefatigable warrior in defending our constitutional values against the kind of onslaught which which is not new really it's been going on for some time now if you had your january 6 we had our uh, december 6 uh, 1992 of course uh shabnam's work of course is has been tremendous and it has been recognized by um, you know she's got several she's the recipient of several important awards for her work on communal harmony uh, but i think shabnam's work is much too diverse to be just encapsulated in these awards that she has got she's been at the forefront of so many causes through the length and breadth of india and more than any award i think it's the recognition by people in general uh shabnam for us is an indispensable reference uh to to all those indians who cherish the idea of an inclusive and diverse india uh shabnam uh, began her grassroots work when she was really young in 1981 uh, she started taking an active role in the uh, sakshatta in the literacy campaign and she was teaching muslim girls and women who had uh, you know uh, in in a basti but she's also a crusader for women's rights in general and just yesterday she was detained by the delhi police along with several other women's rights activists as they were staging a protest outside the madhya pradesh bhavan in new delhi 
against a retrograde proposal by the state government for surveillance of working women uh, perpetually to ensure their safety. So uh, I'm glad to see her here because I mean, she's out of the detention. And uh, one of the hallmarks of Shabnam's work, of course, is her innovative participatory form of campaigning. An example of this campaign, I mean, there are several others, but uh, for example, right in the heart of the of, of, um, of Ahmedabad, for example, she led this campaign called Mere Ghar Aakar Dekho. Please come be my guest and visit my home. This was, I think, in 2017, in which, so the campaign was about people visiting each other's houses, you know, cross community, um, you know, having a tea or just eating something. And by these symbolic acts, breaking uh, the kind of barriers that have been created, particularly in the city of Ahmedabad after the Gujarat riots, with now the city has well-defined borders uh, within the city uh, where the Hindu and Muslim populations reside. So um, Shabnam, of course, has a, a, comes from a family of socially committed individuals, but not just socially committed. Uh, they have been creative, brilliant, uh, simply out of the ordinary. Uh, I would, for example, uh, say that her mother, Kamar Azad Ashmi, uh, she completed an MA in Urdu at the ripe age of 70 from Osmania University in Hyderabad. I was in Hyderabad those days. And um, yes, yeah, so I think it was 1996 when she um, did her MA. And so uh, I, of course, personally have, uh, Shabnam hasn't known me as much, but I have known Shabnam. Uh, more than anything else as Savdar's sister. I was active in the Jannati Manch and uh, as a young woman in 1979, 80, 81. Of course, many of you, all of you would know of Savdar, Savdar Hashmi, who was a committed street theater artist and was attacked and killed on 1st January, 1989 while he was performing a street play. And from then on, uh, Shabnam founded this trust called Sehmat, the Savdar Hashmi Memorial Trust which even today is active, brings together artists, intellectuals, writers, and poets on a platform of uh, communal harmony, diversity, pluralism, and in defense of freedom of expression. After the Gujarat carnage in 2002, Shabnam actively worked in relief camps in uh, Gujarat, and uh, she later formed this organization called uh, Anhad, Act Now for Harmony and Democracy, in order to dire directly kind of uh, counter the communal poison that was uh, being spread in the Indian polity. There's so much more to say about uh, Shabnam. She's uh, fought so many lawsuits against the Union of India on issue of adoption, right? You know, uh, uh, that was a personal fight uh, uh, which she had waged. And so I think uh, I look forward to listening to you, Shabnam, uh, as uh, all those who have gathered here. And thank you very much for this great opportunity to uh, to introduce Shabnam. Excellent. Excellent introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Raji sahab, for inviting me to uh, speak today. And thank you, Sonia, for that introduction. I'm not used to so much of praise. So <laughs> it is quite embarrassing. But nevertheless, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin uh, by saying that Indian democracy is facing an unprecedented crisis. A crisis that 40 years of my activism, uh, I have not seen such a crisis in India. We have faced emergency, we have seen other upheavals in the country, but this kind of attack on our constitution, on the democracy, has not been witnessed earlier. Probably before our birth, during the partition, things could have been or probably were worse than what is happening today. But uh, in our lifetimes, we have not witnessed what is happening in India today. But uh, there are a lot of people who, you know, who are quite amazed at what is happening or who are not ready to believe that this can happen to India. But at least for me, there is nothing shocking and also not unexpected. Because the seeds for this kind of hatred and a total uh, undermining of democracy were sown uh, decades ago. And nothing much was done to 
stop those forces. As many of you would know, and most of the people here are either from India or Indian diaspora, that uh, the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is an umbrella uh, uh, fascist organization, it was formed in 1925. And while during the freedom struggle, our leaders and uh, people of India, they were dreaming of an India which would be diverse, which would be equal, which would have justice. There would be no disparity between various uh, citizens of this country, but the dream of the RSS was always to build a Hindu Rashtra and always to build a country, a nation where only people from one religion would be uh, staying and, and if there were others, then they would not have similar rights. I would like to quote here from M.S. Golwalkar, who is the ideologue of RSS, who is one of the founders of RSS, and what he wrote in his uh, book, I would like to quote that here. He, he, the book, We and Our Nationhood Defined, he said the foreign races in Hindustan must either adopt the Hindu culture and language, must learn to respect and hold in reverence Hindu religion, must entertain no idea but those of glorification of the Hindu race and culture, that is of the Hindu nation and must lose their separate existence to merge in the Hindu race or may st stay in the country wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, far less any preferential treatment, not even citizens' rights. This is at least should be no other course for them to adopt. We are an old nation. Let us deal as old nations out to and do deal with foreign races which have chosen to live in our country. There has been a constant uh, struggle between what RSS thought and believed in and what a large part of India believed in, what kind of India uh, was uh, dreamed of during the freedom struggle. The legacy of the freedom struggle is very, very uh, strong, has been very strong. And the idea of India, the dream of India was always that it will be a country where every citizen will have equal rights that we also enshrined in our constitution beautifully, that irrespective of anyone's, any citizen's age or caste or religion or sexuality, every citizen will get equal rights. But this dream of India, the, the design of India to convert India into a Hindu nation that reached, reached its climax when in 2014, Mr. Modi was elected the prime minister. And I would read a few statements which are from 2014 by various uh, leaders belonging to different organizations floated by the RSS. RSS, as I said, is an umbrella organization, but there are hundreds of organizations which exist uh, under its umbrella. So in 2014, December, the UP Uttar Pradesh Dharam Jagran Samiti's head, Rajeshwar Singh said, our target is to make India Hindu Rashtra by 2021. The Muslims and Christians don't have any right to stay here. So they would either be converted to Hinduism or forced to run away from here. The Hindu Mahasabha announced in Varanasi the launch of Islam Free India campaign on 3rd August 2015. Sadhvi Deva Thakur gave a call on 15th November 2015 to declare an emergency and sterilize Muslims and Christians to control their population. And these, I have used these only to, uh, you know, only as a few examples. If those of you who follow Indian politics, you can find hundreds and hundreds of such uh, hate statements, which have been said and which have been very widely circulated on social media and through the mainstream media also, because mainstream media is totally also controlled by these forces. So as I was saying that since Modi came to power, the dream of the RSS to convert this diverse and plural country into almost a theocratic state that reached its final destination. And to me, it looks like a very big 
multi layered jigsaw puzzle where over the last few decades beginning from the uh, ayodhya movement various parts of that jigsaw puzzle have been already placed uh, on the you know on the card and only a few pieces are remaining so once they connect those pe uh, uh, those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle the full picture will be there now a big question is whether they would be able to complete that picture or whether the indian people the indian masses would be able to stop them from doing that but let me first look at few things which are very important and the attacks which have been coming so from 2014 as i said that india is being dismantled the plural and diverse and democratic india is being dismantled brick by brick there is an all round attack on all democratic institutions in india beginning from the parliament which has actually become quite a mockery of the institution because if you look at the parliament i mean this year there is no winter session of the parliament in the name of covid they have stopped the winter session while the election rallies are not stopping while um, mr amit shah is traveling across bengal because the bengal elections are coming they traveled across bihar they also went to uh, smaller places where even the you know the uh, corporation elections were being held during all those rallies there was no covid but for holding the parliament this is said that because of covid the parliament is not being held even otherwise what we have seen in the parliament that uh, the latest example being of the three uh, farm laws which have which have now in uh, you know which have been passed but during if you saw that whole drama that the opposition was asking for a vote but that was not given to them they just made a huge uh, ruckus in the parliament and uh, the speaker said it is passed they, they just said you know by voice vote we will pass it and it was passed uh, the opposition was demanding that it should be referred to a select committee and there have been the last 6 years there has been a constant struggle because various parliamentary committees are not functioning nothing is referred to them there is nothing which is referred to a select committee and when the government thinks they won't be able to pass a bill they would bring it in as a money bill although money bills can be only connected with the finances but even the aadhar uh, bill was brought in as a money bill or in the form of ordinances uh, they are brought in so there is total mockery of the parliament and the parliamentary democracy when we look at our judiciary because you know when you lose all hope and earlier also when you know there was the vajpayee government also and there were other governments and not that that we are only opposing this government we have fought against the upa government against the congress government and we have always you know had the uh, confidence that one can always go to the supreme court and get justice but what we are seeing now that the supreme court has no time for uh, 370 it has no time for nrc ca it has no time for a uh, large number of people who have been arrested under uapa but it has all the time for mr arnab goswami to provide him on, provide him bail the uh, judiciary if we i mean if you would remember that four topmost judges had to come out and hold a press conference justice lokur and justice chilameshwar and uh, joseph korean and uh, gogoi at that time they had to come out and say that there is democracy is at stake they actually appealed to the people of india to rise and stop these forces from capturing the institutions because in their time they said that all the matters which are important whether it was aadhar whether it was judge loya's matter they are all being referred only to one uh, the one judge or one bench while they were very important matters and the other judges were totally sidelined judges who were honest who would not bow down to the government pressure they were not given any cases so they had to come out and appeal and even in the last few years we have seen the most i think the most glaring there are many many glaring examples but i do want to talk about the ayodhya judgment and how it came about I mean to say that if you go through the judgment, and there is anyway, that's a much larger exercise that took place because uh, across India there were meetings held 
at the grassroots level telling the Muslims that they have to accept the judgment. And there were, you know, RSS was on the ground and a lot of the Muslim leaders, the so-called people who represent India, they collided with them to go from area to area to tell the people that you have to accept the judgment. The judgment said that the demolition was illegal. The fact that the, uh, you know, the murtis were kept there, that was also illegal. After writing about so many illegal things, then it was given to the uh, to the uh, Ram Janambhumi Trust. And one really fails to understand that what kind of intelligence or what kind of logic was the Supreme Court using at that time. And there are, I mean, examples after examples how the judiciary has been undermined and how it has really become, we, have, we saw the Prashant Bhushan case, it, because it became such a huge resistance across India. So I think they had to climb down and just find him one rupee. And uh, then when we look at um, uh, judiciary, we have looked at parliament, the media, which is supposed to be the third pillar of democracy has been totally undermined. It is either totally controlled, like you have channels which are run by Arnab Goswami or you know the Republic, the Times, Times Now and so on and so forth, which do not represent what is happening in the country at all. They take their dictates from the government and they do not, they, whether they don't want to defy it or they have become a part of their you know, management, one doesn't know. But there is no, no sign, not even a small whimper from them when any, even the biggest atrocities might happen in India. But they would only toe the government line. On the other hand, journalists who are who have dissenting voices, they were forced out of various television channels and newspapers and magazines, many of them. In the last six years, there are four, 40 journalists who have been killed, who have been killed. I mean, they are mainly from smaller places, so the news does not reach uh, many places, but 40 journalists have been killed and over 200 have been seriously injured in attacks organized by various state and non-state actors. So media is totally controlled. If it was not for the social media, if it was not for uh, you know, portals like Wire and Citizen and Scroll and many other such portals, then what is happening in India would probably not even come out. If we look at the executive, uh, in many places what we hear, I don't have first-hand information, but you know what keeps traveling to us is that in most of the places, especially the PMO and other places, is mainly the Gujarat Kada, which has been brought from there. And in uh, 2018, the government announced that there would be now lateral entry to uh, IAS and uh, IPS officers, which means that, uh, you know, there are thousands and lakhs of actually aspirants who work for years to enter IAS, to pass those examinations, to go through those tests, and interviews and everything. Now, by passing them, the government has passed uh, a resolution or they brought in some new, uh, it's not a legislation, it's a, uh, it's, it was, I think they announced it. I don't know the exact, uh, it's an executive order, I think, that they would be taking uh, now direct recruitment into IS at the director level, at the deputy secretary level, which is extremely dangerous because you, I mean, who would they appoint? Obviously people who are with them, who believe in their ideology. Apart from this, there is an all round attack on scientific institutions, on educational institutions, and on our cultural institutions. There is, I mean, I know that I have to finish in 30, 35 minutes, so I will not go into the details. I'm just, uh, just mentioning some of these things. The new education policy, which has been brought in, is uh, only to privatize the whole education to you know take away the uh, opportunity from the especially from the marginalized sections who come from poor backgrounds the dalits the adivasis minorities that they should not get good education so it will be confined only to you know, a very small section who can pay uh, you know very high fees they, they are saying that we are in the name of rationalizing schools at the grassroots level. What they are doing is they're saying we will build a very big school at the district level. 
and we would rationalize and we would combine all the schools in that district, which means that small schools which are there in villages, which are up to fifth or eighth class, where a very poor person can also send their children, they are going to be closed. And it is going to affect directly, especially the women, especially the girls, because we still live in a highly patriarchal system. The, in rural India, especially, no parent is going to send their girls to five kilometers or 10 kilometers to a district school. If there is a school in the village, then girls manage to study till fifth or eighth, and after which also a large number of girls drop out, especially from the minorities, from the Dalit communities who cannot afford to send their girls to, uh, you know, to far off places. If we look at other institutions like RBI that everyone has seen that how RBI's autonomy was totally undermined. And even, you know, people whom they uh, appointed themselves, Urjit Patel was their man, governor of RBI. Even he resigned because uh, as a professional, he felt that the autonomy of RBI was being uh, undermined. Any institution that we look at, the elected governments, how, I mean, it has become a whole drama. The elected governments in Manipur, in Goa, in Madhya Pradesh, after being elected, they were just toppled because of the money power which this government has, which the BJP has. They bought, openly bought MLAs, offering them huge amounts of money. The whole election, uh, you know, scenario has become extremely uh, fraudulent because, because of the election, uh, uh, electoral bonds which have been brought in. Nobody knows where the funding is coming from, who is getting this funding. So on one hand, huge amount of money is coming in and a very big problem with the elections are our EVM machines. Despite all the questions raised on the EVM machines, despite all the resistance which is coming from across India. If you go to any, even the remotest village in India, if you go and ask them about the machine, and even an uneducated uh, person who lives in a very remote part of India says, we didn't vote for them, but the machine stole our vote. And this is the story across India. Labor laws have been changed since, the, since they have come. Uh, large, there is a, all round attack on the scientific temper. We have, I mean, it is not that it is somebody on the street who is attacking scientific temper. It is the prime minister of India who says that we had plastic surgery uh, in ancient times. There is another minister who says we had internet. There is another minister who says that the peacocks procreate through their tears and so on and so forth. In one of the interactions with young students, school students, Prime Minister Modi said that, you know, there is no climate change. It is when people go grow old, they feel uh, more uh, during winters, they feel very cold and there is no climate change happening. So with these kind of constant statements, which are, which are circulated large, largely uh, on social media and on national media, we are propagating an atmosphere of anti-science and anti-scientific temper. There is then a, a very, uh, you know, uh, concerted attack on freedom of expression, on artists, on intellectuals, and uh, there is an attack on the right to choice. There is an attack on right to what you wear, what you eat, where, whom you can fall in love with, whom you can marry. All that is being attacked. It doesn't look like we are living in a democratic state any longer. Because everything you do, everything that India stood for is being undermined. And it is, there are, you know, there are instances in millions and one, one keeps now forgetting them. Because if you, we had released a, uh, uh, a book called Dismantling India. It was a report in, uh, on four, after four years of Modi. And that had thousands of instances of hate speeches, of attacks on minorities, of attacks on Dalits, of attacks on women. So it is just impossible to keep track because every single day there is a new attack. There is a new undermining of, uh, of an institutions of 
uh, either culture or education or any of our democratic institutions. And uh, things are going quite out of control. Along with this, there is a very concerted attack on women, which Sonia spoke about only one uh, incident which happened recently. Uh, there are, you know, their idea about women is exactly the same uh, of what Hitler and what Nazis and fascists thought of women. They see the women only in the role of, uh, of uh, citizens who would create children, who would create sons, not even children, who would create sons uh, and who would fight for the nation. That is there and who would look after their families. There is no other concept for women which they have which the RSS, the women wing, which is, could not call the RSS, which is called the Swayam Sevika, uh, not Swayam Sevika, Sevika, Rashtriya Sevika uh, Sanstar. They propagate uh, regularly among women that how to be good wives, how to, uh, you know, not fight with your husband and so on and so forth. I mean, the very retrogressive ideas they are propagating among women and they are doing these workshops across India. But the kind of attacks which have come directly and recently, one is what Sonia talked about, the Madhya Pradesh uh, system, which they are calling. They are, the chief minister said, we are bringing in a system where any woman who goes outside her home to work would register in the police and the police would track her for her security. So they think that in the name of security, they would do this surveillance on, on women. This is one example from a BJP state. Uh, about a month ago, UP government and also Madhya Pradesh government has brought in an ordinance where any girl who, if she converts to another religion uh, during her, after her marriage, then anybody from the family, anybody from the girl's family can file an FIR against the boy. While it doesn't say Muslims or Islam, but it is targeted against Muslim boys, Muslim young boys who are marrying Hindu women or Christian women or Dalit women or any woman. It is specifically targeting them and it is targeting the women's autonomy, the women's capacity to think and decide for themselves. And it is an attempt to control women's sexuality, which this government has been doing continuously. There are attacks on uh, one after another you can if you if you uh, the number of rapes if you see which have happened since 2014 they have gone up many many times and this is the first time that in india we are witnessing this that the rapists have been felicitated they have been honored they have been garlanded and not by anybody on the road but by the members of the ruling party by the ministers, by the elected members of the ruling party. They have been, they are supporting, they are fighting, they are taking out candle marches for the rapist. This was something unprecedented. In the Hathras rape case, uh, where a Dalit uh, girl was raped by the upper caste men, the UP chief minister, he started this whole campaign that this is an international uh, conspiracy to malign us. So they are going to any absurd levels and there is hardly any national media who is questioning them, apart from social media and activists and uh, other, you know, uh, artists, intellectuals who oppose this. Even recently when this uh, farmer's uh, bill was not bill, but somebody had gone to the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice of India you know, he says that uh, the women and children should go back home from the, from the protest site. I mean, this is absolutely obnoxious and absolutely unacceptable. What is the Chief Justice trying to say? That women cannot protest in this country? Does he know that in rural India, 65% of women who work, they are involved in agricultural work? I mean, the kind of people we, are, we have now sitting in various positions, they are not only that they are uh, totally insensitive, they are illiterate. They do not know the reality of this country. 
for a chief justice to say that the women should go back it is absolutely obnoxious you are basically saying that a woman's position is in her home and why is she sitting on delhi borders and protesting where a large number of women are involved <coughs> in agriculture sorry just a moment take your time there is no shortage of time yeah. <coughs> there have been statements by various leaders and these are well known leaders i mean i i haven't noted down the name but mainly saying that for their own agenda of hatred they want to use women and they want to use women bodies so there have been statements one after another saying that the hindu women must produce 10 children because the population of muslims are growing and we must compete and we must not become a minority in this country so first they create a fear psychosis and they create a whole campaign against the muslim community and then they force the hindu women to create and to produce children they think that they control the bodies of indian women they think they control the bodies of hindu women and they want to use them only for giving birth to children and there have been not one but many many thing many many statements such statements which have come from various parts of the country and by senior rss leaders also then there are attacks and very organized attacks on minorities against the christians an average of 300 attacks per year since modi has come to power so in the last 6 years there have been close to 2000 attacks on christians attack on churches attack on pastors attack on fathers in many cases attacking them grievously and the attacks on christians are a, are a little different from the attacks actually quite different from the attacks on muslims because they are targeting christians who are living in remote areas who are living in remote places where they do not have Uh, too many people around them maybe five christian families 10 christian families and these are growing continuously there are many organizations who are uh, documenting this on muslims especially on muslims the attack has been very very organized since they have come uh, i'm sure most of you have heard about the lynchings in the name of cattle trading in the name of uh, slaughtering of cows there have been attacks on muslims mob lynchings and i don't know the exact number over 90 i think have people who were mob lynched and killed there are ways of uh, there is total economic boycott of the muslims in many many places an open boycott only yesterday uh, that video i don't know if you have seen it was going viral on twitter where some uh, leaders of some hindu organizations are openly saying that uh, muslims should be attacked and killed and anybody who reads quran becomes a monster openly saying that also attacking the constitution and these kind of things you know even if you uh, go to the court with them it takes years for any action the police does not take any action because the police and the judiciary and the media and everyone seems to be totally controlled so while the hate speeches against the muslims keep going on uh, there is nothing much which is done from the state and uh, also in this video yesterday and many uh, earlier videos you can find where there is an open call to economically boycott the muslim community openly saying don't buy anything from a muslim shop don't let them sell that video also had viral that i'm sure you must have seen during covid when they were attacking the uh, you know small muslim uh, uh, vegetable sellers who were going into areas they were forced away from there and they were told not to enter those colonies again because they will not buy from any muslim uh, this is of course uh, these are the direct attacks and the much bigger attack which came which although it has been portrayed as just one second the heater was burning too <laughs> uh that you know it was portrayed as an attack on muslims although i have my difference of opinion there the whole 
attack which came in the name of CA and NRC. While the CA said that, uh, you know, citizens coming from outside who are all the other religions except the Muslims, that is a definitely a discriminatory law and which uh, says that apart from the Muslims, they would allow everyone inside. But if we look at NRC, NRC and what we have seen in Assam where over 19 lakh people were left out of that, uh, you know, list of uh, the uh, register which was being prepared. Uh, they were out of the 19 lakhs, there was a large section of people who were, who were non-Muslims. So it was, I think, done in a very deliberate way to make it a Muslim Muslim issue so that the large number of the Indians do not participate in it. Although initially there were a large number of people and students and other civil society groups who were part of the anti-NRC and CA protest, but later it was confined to the Muslim areas. But that is also a tool on, uh, on you know, how they are attacking the minorities. In Assam, we have seen there are already, they have detention centers. In many other places, detention centers are being made, which are for, which are called that they are for foreign infiltrators. And foreign infiltrators are mainly, uh, I mean, in the case of Assam, yes, there are people from other religions also, all non assamis are called foreign infiltrators. But in case of different parts of the country, they would mainly be targeting uh, the Muslim community and all the other marginalized community like the Dalits and the transgender communities who would who might and might not have all the records which they are asking for. Uh, apart from this, there is a major attack on transparency. The uh, Right to Information uh, Act has been diluted since they have come. Uh, recently, uh, only today actually, uh, over 100 IS officers have released a, written a letter asking about the PM care fund, which is, you know, which is totally, uh, there is no transparency there. And uh, the last point I would like to make here is that uh, there is the whole functioning of this government is totally authoritarian. Challenges are many and I mean, I, we would not be able to finish them in, in even two hours. And I'm also not, uh, you know, uh, not well versed with everything. The major attack and major challenge also is our economy, which is now going uh, down to minus 7.5 or even less than that. And uh, that is because the way in which this government is functioning, it, is, it works in such an authoritarian fashion. And the biggest example of that is the uh, demonetization, which happened in on November 8, 2018. I mean, one fine day, the prime minister comes and announces that from midnight, the 1,500 votes, uh, rupee notes will uh, not be, you know, they will be like uh, dust, they will be like uh, scrap. So, and this has happened not only on this, even GST was brought in like that. And there are many, even the abrogation of 370 happened like that. Uh, the uh, so-called surgical strikes and Balakot strikes, again, nobody was consulted, not even, in the, in the uh, demonetization case, the finance minister was not consulted. In the Bala court attacks, the defense minister was not consulted. So there is even within the government, I mean, we are talking about how we are facing attacks on, the, on our democratic rights, but even within the government, within their own political party, there is no democracy. It's just an authoritarian rule and ruled by two men. There are, there are no women involved. There is, it's a highly patriarchal, fascist, authoritarian rule, which we are facing in India today. But I think that whatever I have spoken and whatever problem, there are of course many, many other problems. The whole question of poverty and how all the wealth is being taken away from the poor, how the lands are being taken away from the poor and being handed over to uh, crony capitalists, just two, three of them. It is no longer even a model which the earlier governments was, were pursuing. They were also having new liberal economic policies, but there were at least a large number of industrialists who were, you know, who were, uh, who uh, got those contracts or who got uh, work from uh, governments. And here this only Ambani and Adani, and maybe one or two more. 
It is just the whole wealth is being concentrated in a few hands and the poor are becoming poorer. And uh, we, what we saw during the lockdown, which also was a highly authoritarian way of announcing the lockdown where lakhs and lakhs of poor workers left big cities and walked down for thousands of kilometers. And the unemployment is 40 at 45 years peak there. I mean, India had never had this kind of unemployment. But despite all this, I think that the biggest challenge for us, these are all challenges, huge challenges. The biggest challenge is that despite what is happening in the country, we have a huge population which is cheering Modi, which is cheering the government. Our biggest challenge is how do we change these minds? How do we, you know, inculcate some amount of rationality into these minds? Because these minds have become totally trapped and closed. And this has happened because the right wing has worked for decades poisoning them. It has been a very slow but very concerted effort to sow the seeds of hatred and water them regularly. You know, during the emergency, when I was in college at that time, it was, it was a huge challenge for India. It was for the first time probably that India was seeing an attack on our democratic rights and authoritarian rule. But the people of this country were not divided. People of this country, majority of the people of this country were together. And they, in one voice, they were against democracy. And in two years, they threw out Indira Gandhi. From 1975 to 1977, she was out. But now that we have a semi-fascist state, we have an authoritarian ruler, we have an absolutely undemocratic and authoritarian functioning of the state, all the state mechanisms and non-state actors on the roads who are attacking, who are killing, the people of this country are still divided because a large number of them are still controlled by the controlled media and their minds have been poisoned. And I think that is the biggest challenge for everyone, that how do we change that? And keeping the hope alive in these times is probably also the most difficult task. How do you keep hope alive? How do you, you know, convince yourself that you have to keep fighting against all these forces, knowing fully well that your own comrades have been arrested, that they are in jail? Whether it is Gautam Navlakha, whether it is Sudha Bhardwaj, whether it is Barbara Rao, and Anantel Tumre, there is a long list, Shoma Sen, they are all our fellow activists who have been arrested under UAPA. How do you convince yourself when Gauri Lankesh is killed, when Pansare and Dabolkar are killed, that you have to keep on fighting? That is the biggest challenge, that you have to keep your hope alive for the sake of the future generations. Because if, if you lose hope, if the activists who are still outside, who are not arrested, if they lose hope, then what will happen to the next generations? Are we going to leave an India uh, for the next generation, which is authoritarian, which is fascist, and which will be much worse probably if the protest and the resistance is not there? That is something which one has to deal with every single day. It is not true that people like us do not sometimes also have doubts or they do not at, at some time feel afraid. Yes, one is ready that one can be arrested anytime, one can be killed at any time, there could be a case put on you. But then you have to constantly struggle with that and keep on the hope alive. And I think for activists in India, and there has been a major, major attack on the civil society, from maligning them to closing down their organizations, to freezing their accounts, to jailing them, still people are fighting. 
and i would like to mention here just a few of it is not possible to talk about every single resistance because despite all this there is resistance and because of the resistance there is hope the you uh, rajiv bhai mentioned in the in the beginning i think about the ca and rc protests and they were huge they were huge they were across india india has never seen the muslim woman come on the roads in the name of safeguarding the constitution and that was amazing despite many differences that was amazing it was crushed of course in the name of the lockdown and pandemic and a large number of people have been arrested and again even uh, the riots which took place immediately uh, in february uh, last year many of our friends have been called the masterminds of the of those riots they are being called to the special cell by the police there are more than 500 people from delhi activist student leaders women activists from these areas who have been called by the special cell and grilled i mean can you imagine that somebody can say that apurva nand is a mastermind of delhi rights the kind of allegations which are being put on our most respected public intellectuals it is absolutely mind boggling and only a crazy and a fascist government can do that so one has to constantly and there are there are you know hundreds of others who are in jail apurva is not arrested but those young girls from pinjra tod are arrested natasha and and the other girl. and many other young muslim girls who had come out but nevertheless that resistance against nrc and ca gave a lot of hope to this country uh when the judges came out from the supreme court well, the four judges i i talked about when they came out and appealed to the people of this india uh, people of this country to safeguard democracy you know how we responded uh it was actually frankly that appeal we were anyway planning to do a lot of things and doing various uh, programs and uh, constantly but that appeal made us think and initially ani raja from nfiw uh, myself and uh, i have a friend called lena dabiru who's also with anhal we just discussed an idea that you know why don't women go out and travel across india and appeal to the people to safeguard the constitution and that campaign was called baate aman ki and we ended up 100 women traveled on five different routes 20 in each route uh, laila is also here from that campaign and aruna is here from that campaign joining from chennai and and bangalore i saw them on the list uh, we we traveled across on five different routes 20 women in each uh, on each route and we covered 200 cities and towns and did over 500 programs it was a huge huge uh, campaign probably the biggest campaign of women uh, which was which had over 2000 groups together uh, marching on the streets doing public meetings taking out rallies doing cultural events it was a huge campaign and if any of you are interested you can you can go and uh, you know look for it on facebook page that was a very interesting campaign and i think the women of this country stood up to safeguard the constitution it was the first time that women were not going out to say stop violence against women they went out to say we want to safeguard the constitution and that was a very very important and very interesting campaign then we have seen the student campaigns uh, whether it was occupy ugc or uh, campaigns in in jnu after from 2014 onwards the student campaigns across india in the um, film uh, institute in pune in many in uh, iit chennai there have been so many campaigns by the students and resistance by the students which has been uh, really giving a lot of hope to people because when you see young people on the streets that give a lot of hope there is a there is a uh, organization of retired ias and um, officers and ips officers and ifs officers as well as uh, retired officers from the services navy army 
they have been extremely active, writing memorandums, raising their voices. And that's a very, again, a very important resistance which one is seeing uh, in India. Then of course, our writers, poets, intellectuals, uh, you saw everyone returning their awards uh, when the attack came on freedom of expression and when everyone was called anti-national in the, in the beginning, uh, when they came, they were initially calling everyone into the anti-national. They continue to do so, but in the beginning, it was a very concerted effort. There has been a lot of resistance from a large number of journalists and hats off to the to young journalists who are running YouTube channels, who are running portals, because if they were not there, then the voice of resistance would not have reached anyone. Because unless there is a media of communication to, you know, to let people hear you, there is no way that you can reach out to people. So it has been a very strong resistance from them. And the latest, which everyone knows, which as Gohar said in the beginning, is giving us a lot of hope, uh, is the farmer's resistance. That is amazing. I mean, I have been, and both God and many other people who are here probably, who are in Delhi, have been to all these borders, to Singhu border, to Tikri border, to the Palwal border, and to uh, Shah Jahanpur uh, and Ghazipur. And what you see there is also unprecedented. Like I said, that there is an uh, unprecedented attack on our democracy. This is an unprecedented campaign. And and not a campaign, it should be called a movement and a big resistance movement. On, uh, on Tikri border, we, one day we moved inside Haryana and when the tractors and trolleys stopped, the last trolley, when that was there, we stopped there and checked on Google map, it showed 23 kilometers to Tikri border. So on that day, which is almost, I think 10 days ago, on that day, the farmers, from Tikri border inside Haryana, they were occupying 23 kilometers. On Singhu border also, they are occupying over 15 kilometers. On other borders, uh, the numbers were less, but nevertheless, the spirits are high. And you are amazed at their commitment. What is also very amazing that you talk to any woman, you talk to any a farmer who is 70, 75, or even 80 years, or you talk to young boys and girls, every one of them knows why they are there. There is no confusion. They are politically so clear, and they are not talking only of getting the three bills repealed. They are saying, we want a country where everyone is respected. We do not want this hatred. We do not want this divide between Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh Isai. They are talking about every issue. They are talking about changing, repealing these bills, uh, uh, laws, and also talking about the dream which Bhagat Singh saw for this country. So that is something very amazing. And I think that this is something which has given us a lot of hope because so far, all other resistance movements have been suppressed by this government. Whether it was CA, whether all other students' movement, other movements, not that they have died down, they're not going to die down, but the farmers' movement has given a lot of hope. And I sincerely think that uh, maybe we would be able to throw out this government because the farmers say that they are not going back. They are saying that on 26 January, they are going to enter Delhi I frankly don't know what is going to happen because uh, this government might do anything. They might use any kind of force, but they are collecting and thousands and thousands of more tractors are arriving now on the borders to enter Delhi on 26 January. So I think I would uh, end there. I have, I have given two songs if they can be played. One is from the if we do not rise movement, sorry, I forgot to speak about it. On 5th September, there was a major campaign online and offline, again by women organizations. Over 540 organizations came together under the name of If We Do Not Rise, Hum Agar Uthe Nahi to. And uh, there were protests on the ground, there was music, there, was, there were Facebook lives, 
oh, over 15 lakh people that day on 5th September participated. A large number of visual artists and performers, ordinary citizens, activists, everyone participated. So one song, which is called Jago, is uh, the Bombay team prepared this song, if it is possible to play that. And the second song, which I have given you, is uh, actually a marriage in uh, Punjab where women are singing, and there's a one a transgender, they are singing a song inside. I mean, it's a marriage happening. And that song is about the farmer's struggle. And I believe that when uh, protest and resistance reaches these cultural spaces, reaches your home where you are having a marriage, and in that marriage you are singing and you, you are saying that let's go to Delhi and let's do a protest there and let's do a dharna there, then that movement is not going to die. Then that resistance will, will be alive. And uh, if it is possible to play them, please do. If not, then no, no, this sure. is where I end. Thank no. you very much. Just give me one second, I'll play that. So while he's trying to take some good.
This is the second song which is from a marriage in Punjab. Hey, Jamal, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the So for those who did not understand the song, she's basically singing and saying, let's go to Delhi. And Modi has brought in a new law. We are not going to be afraid of that. We will go to Delhi. We'll do a dharna there. Whether Modi comes or his father comes or his grandfather comes, we are going to continue that protest. In And this is happening in a marriage. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. It was really very inspiring. And your speech was very inspiring. And there is, in spite of all the miserable situation, there is hope. Hope should be always there. Hope is alive. And so is the struggle. So uh, before um, Dr. Hussain starts his session, let me have the announcement for the coming uh, week uh, talk. It is going to be by John, Dr. John Esposito, a very well-respected senior professor of Georgetown University, is going to talk on Islamophobia in global, global affairs. Uh, John Esposito is a very well-known figure, especially on Islam. He is the founding director of Prince Al-Walid Center for Muslim and Christian Understanding and is a professor of international and Islamic studies at Georgetown University. So he will be talking coming Saturday. Uh, over to you, Rafat. Hello. Yes. Okay, thank you. So Madam Shabnam, it was an excellent overview of uh, the resistance your organization and other organizations are showing and hats off to you. And uh, you see there are too many comments over there in the chat box, but uh, very few questions. So those who want us to ask the question, please show your interest either in the <coughs> chat, uh, chat box or you can raise your hand. 
And uh, so the first question, uh, by the way, the, the song was very inspiring and I really loved it. And this was a cherry on the top of uh, your talk. And uh, so the first question is uh, from uh, Zafar Iqbal Saab and he wants to know how can he support the Sahmat uh, organization? So either you can type in uh, in the chat box, uh, the email address or whatever, or send it to Razi Bhai, and then he will uh, distribute among uh, us. So that's uh, one of the comment. Uh, the next person is uh, Sayyad Hussain. And uh, for the people who are really interested to ask a question, of course, there are so many comments and they are very inspiring. But uh, for the question and answer session, I really want to know whether you have a question. So the first person I already, uh, is uh, Sayyad Hussain. I think uh, he's the one who is from Canada. Sayyad Hussain Saab, please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. And uh, if he is getting ready, the next person is uh, Dr. Kanchana Alazanek. And my apology if uh, I pronounce your name wrong. And uh, Dr. Kanchana. So Sayyid Hussain is ready. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so go ahead, Sayyid Sir. Yeah, this is uh, uh, a thought which uh, I have and I want to ask this question that uh, once a system like this present democratic system, which based on uh, majority's uh, selection of the ruling uh, you know, uh, ruling leaders uh, in a country. So if uh, majority uh, is given some, uh, you know, is scared that, okay, the minority is this, minority is that, then un uh, unwittingly uh, the uh, majority will support uh, those people who say they will deliver uh, them from this uh, situation. So it is, my question is when it is inbuilt in a democracy system to have majority and the tyranny of majority that follows it, then uh, is there any way we can modify, I 100% believe in popular vote, but modify the system in such a way that uh, majority is uh, not really uh, so effective that which is in democratic system. So that's the question. Thank you. We are talking of electoral reforms <laughs> and <clears throat> there has been a talk in India, but it has not reached anywhere of also of, uh, you know, that uh, changing this system, which is uh, where the majority vote decides who will win. I don't think that this system is going to be changed. What needs to be changed in India and in other places are, you know, going back to the ballot because we still don't think that majority of Indians are voting for them. Even at the peak of his popularity, uh, the percentage of vote is 40%. And uh, at least some of us very strongly believe that there, there were manipulations and rigging. And uh, you know there are many, many people who are talking about how EVMs are rigged. You don't have to rig all of them. It's a... So what we need to you know, have a major campaign around the EVMs also. But changing the whole electoral system, I, I, I'm not even frankly uh, very much qualified to speak about that system. Somebody else who has been working on electoral reforms probably would have been a better person to reply to that. I said modify. I, I know it is a popular uh, opinion is very important because if you don't have the popular, then it is again uh, a controlled system which we have uh, seen what happens. So I'm just talking about modifying. Just like uh, you already mentioned that if you have 100% uh, voting, it will be better. Yes, that is a modification we can do in an uh, uh, electoral system that it should be compulsory, there should be penalty. I'm just guessing. Uh, that would be very undemocratic. So they keep the democracy, but make that it would again more... be very undemocratic. If you say there would be penalty and it's compulsory, that's what even they are proposing that we will make it compulsory. 
but it's a you know one part of it is that yes uh, not all anti uh, right wing votes are going uh, into the boxes the second thing is also that uh, they also get divided and the reality third reality is also that a large number of people over the last few 3 4 decades have been totally communalized and at the last moment they play some communal card to uh, by which the votes again get concentrated uh, for them so it is more of a ideological battle also which has to be fought by political parties i mean small organizations and activists can't fight this battle alone so the big the, political parties have to also fight thank yes. you yeah. uh, so uh, next person is eram sajed and after that uh, uh, fazal khan saab so please be ready and then naid so eram sajed please yeah. unmute yourself uh, thank you fazal saab assalam alaikum my question is uh, madam shabnam uh, before independence Uh, international congress declared that it is a it was a representative of all communities in india and after independence india was endowed with the uh, democracy and uh, secularism constitutionally but now we see that difference between brahmin and harijan and hindu muslim sikh is uh, widening my question is why this chasm could not be uh, eliminated or lessened despite of uh, the secular and democratic nature of the constitution of india thank you well while, while you know the uh, legacy of the freedom struggle and the values of the freedom struggle were enshrined in the indian constitution we did very little to change the society because it was a highly fragmented society it was casteist yes. it was patriarchal it was uh, also communal and there was a need to work towards that which i think was not done uh, one that initially the kind of ruined india that we got the government gave you know was just working towards how to take out people from poverty and how to make them literate during nehru's time all the universities and schools and scientific institutions and so on were built and uh, even people who were left of the center uh, you know even a white talk of 1947 i'm saying as late as the 80s people just laughed and they said these are fringe elements they can never come to center but uh, nobody took them seriously that was a major major <coughs> various political forces and rss as i said kept on working Uh, it also grew much faster after the opening of economy because uh, once you go on the path of new liberal economy you also in the name of development uproot a huge number of people who then become a fodder for the communal forces so it's quite complicated i mean uh, we can't put all the blame on uh, congress but yes they are to be blamed also and also other secular political parties because what we are facing today many of these things started during the upa rule especially the new liberal economy and also the hatred i mean let's face it opening of the ayodhya gates was done by rajiv gandhi the uh, you know turning uh, of the shabano case was changed during rajiv gandhi's regime so there are many and there are many many other questions also and now uh, many a times there is a very you know very difficult to decide whether there is some difference between their carter on the ground uh, but also the other reality is that because i traveled extensively and, ext and i mean during covid it has gone very less but anywhere you go uh even a smallest village you find extremely secular uh, people who are attached either with the left or with the congress and in bihar with uh, rjd and other political parties you still find fantastic people on the ground so there is still hope but you are right that right now the society is highly fragmented extremely fragmented much more than i think what we were when we got independence 
Thank you. Uh, Fazal Khan sir. Thank you Rafat. Uh, I think Kanchan also wanted to ask a question in between. Yeah, because, so do, uh, Dr. Kanchan was the second person. So Dr. Uh, Kanchan I already asked him. Do you want to unmute? Okay, let's so Fazal bhai ask the question and then we will come back to Dr. Kanchan. Okay, okay. go ahead Fazal bhai. Okay, thank you. Um Ms. Asmi, um, I think it's, it was a very good uh, review of the situation in India and also your organization and other working a very good job. Uh, also, the song was very many, meaningful and timely. Uh, I think we might need more of that. But um, I think um, Muslims are, uh, I think a gift to RSS and BJP. As long as they are there, I don't think BJP would like them to get out of India, which is impossible anyway. They will rather keep them and use them for electoral purpose. The other comment is that you also said, and I have heard this from other speakers as well, that even at the peak, uh, only BJP had 40, 42% of the shares of vote. But I can tell you, and I'm sure that you, uh, go all over the India, you know more, but my experience is that even if those who don't vote for BJP, they vote for, for example, I come from Banaras, so I can say that uh, Samajwadi party and Bahujan and all those, even those people who vote for Samajwadi and Bahujan, mentality is communal and they subscribe the BJP ideology, they vote to Samajwadi party only because they're associated with them. But ideologically, they are very close to BJP, especially when it comes to Muslims. Now, other thing is that uh, what Kisans are doing, see in any country, when revolution comes, the government changes mostly when the economy is bad, which we hear that economy is bad in India. Unfortunately, in 60-70% people living in, in villages, they hardly have one or one meal or something. So for the economy to go bad, it's not going to affect much to the rural people because they already don't have much. And they have started voting to BJP. So I don't see that there is going to be much change in electoral uh, for BJP. I think they are going they are there are going to stay there for a long time because the mind is so communal that uh, no political party, if, you, if you, you know that very well that even lynching and all those, no political parties came and protested. Few <laughs> individual academics, intellectuals like you and others. So I think BJP is going to stay for a long time, but you never know in politics. That's my comment, actually. I'm, I'm not sure it was a question. Well, as far as you're saying about the ideology of the Carter, uh, to some extent, yes, you are right, many. Uh, but the only, only difference of opinion which I have is that not everyone in Samajwadi party would be communal, not everyone in Congress would be communal. Congress, Carter, to a great extent is also communalized and so is of other political parties. But there is still a secular section which is surviving, which is there and which is fighting back. About their uh, losing or remaining there for long, yes. I mean, it looks to us that they will, before the farmers movement started, it was a foregone conclusion that they are not going anywhere. Uh, farmers movement has given some hope it might and might not work but if uh, along with the farmers movement if we are if we can go back to the ballots then maybe the situation will change despite communalism despite uh, the hatred there is still a vast majority which has not got communalized to the extent that we think. See, what happens that the voices are not heard. We, we hear only 
Arnab Goswami and Times Now and Aaj Tak and so on so forth. Uh, whereas the reality on the ground sometimes is very different. And at least one is witnessing that among the farmers. I mean, I would have also thought that majority of the people in Punjab would have been, you know, have become communal. But the clarity that one is seeing there with anyone, there are lakhs of them. You can go and sit in any tent outside their trolleys and you will not find anyone who is not very clear politically that they want a secular, diverse country and they want these bills to be back. But that is, again, just confined to these farmers. We will have to see how it goes. Uh, if one decides that they are not, never going to leave, then there won't be any hope to keep on fighting. Was, Thank you. I was, I was just telling a friend yesterday that all I want now, I'm 63, I don't want to die before Modi is defeated. So <laughs> why does well defeat him? Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Shabna, madam. There yeah, Razi bhai, what were you saying? Yeah, there are a couple of people who are raising hand, Anwar Naseem Saab or... Wow, wow. They are not raising, I don't see them here, but... Uh... Anwar, Anwar Naseem, yeah. Uh... Okay, thank you. And uh, um, please ask uh, Arti, she can send me the names. Thank you. So the next person is uh, Nahid, our regular feature. Nahid, please. Anwar Naseem. You are forgetting Dr. Kanchan continuously. <laughs> my, my apologies. My apologies. Please, uh, Nahid, yeah, yeah, Nahid, you, please you can, hold on. No, Nahid, if you want, please. Uh, you can, if you want, you can put Kajin before me. Yeah, but Nahid, uh, please. No, no, Nahid, uh, yeah. please hold no, on. Is, he no was problem. Nahid. Uh, he yeah. was much ahead of you, and yeah, I you called. Please, please. I called his name, but uh, somehow missed it. Doctor Kanchan. Is she? Well. Uh, 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 First of all, I'm so happy to hear you speak, Shabnam. I've heard a lot about you from friends in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, when, when the farmers' laws were passed, my husband and I were talking with friends from Anantapur, and well, I told them, well, you don't meddle with farmers from Punjab. There is going to be a real strong outcome. And, uh, and it has gone on for so many weeks, which I see is very positive. Uh, my question, or rather my thinking is, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't other farmers also join in this protest? And isn't the time ripe now? Or does it, it at least give the opportunity for other networks, both activists, as well as those who work in social development to come together? Am I just dreaming? Or can we really use this as an opportunity to somehow come and knit together. Because I, I really believe in people's movement and the civil society. How do you see it? And not forgetting women. I mean, Gandhiji realized the strength of women, the power of women, and he took them along with him. So given this scenario, how do you see this, Shabdanji? Thank you, one, Dr. Kanchana. One is that it is being propagated that they are farmers only from Punjab and Haryana. Yes, they are in big numbers, mm -hmm. but there are farmers from Rajasthan, from Haryana, from uh, Maharashtra who are already at the borders with them. Mm -hmm. There are farmers from UP, not in so much number, but they are there. And there are farmers protests happening across India. They might not be able to travel in COVID to these distances, mm -hmm. but the protests are happening across India and farmers are joining. Uh, on 3rd of January, uh, not 3rd January, sorry, 10th of January, I'm forgetting the date, women from various organizations as well as the states which are next to Delhi, Haryana, Rajasthan, even Madhya Pradesh, UP, women uh, jathas went to all the farmers uh, uh, protests. I went to Palwal, there was somebody else who went to, so about 100 women each went to these jathas, which is of course a very small number as far as the mobilization is concerned, but that is happening. 18th is being observed as Women Farmers Day. And again, women organizations, at least from Delhi and nearby states are going to uh, 
the farmers uh, protest so hopefully it will pick up over time and individually a lot of people are going consistently i mean wherever i go i meet people from delhi and neighboring states who are visiting this but for this to grow you are very right it has to pick up across india these protests should start happening now in other states by civil society by farmers by women groups in support of the farmers and there is time of course always there is time to come together yeah thank you thank you okay the next person is uh, kaisar abbas no sorry nahid nahid first and then kaisar abbas okay so i i just want to ask uh, to mobilize more people about the reality which is going on so that uh, in the next future 2024 some change can be brought about is there any chance i don't know <laughs> i don't know if this if this protest continues if it builds in other states and especially mm -hmm. if political parties come out of their slumber because they seem to be sleeping uh the kind of response that one would have expected from them in the farmers movement left is quite active left parties are quite active across india but in many other things which have happened in this country one would have expected a much bigger response from political parties you see it is a political fight so only ordinary people can go up to a certain level unless it is a movement like the farmers movement but otherwise political response is very much required if that happens if they are active then maybe something will happen ultimately they have to fight the elections i don't have to fight the election so they have yeah, to yeah but up. what we see actually yeah, true but what we see actually the uh, opposition or the other parties they are redundant hardly uh, they have any face or uh, i don't know the situation is very bleak they are not redundant totally because one is that they mm -hmm. the, the structure across india or across states if it's a regional party they have structures across states across their state mm -hmm. and the national parties have structures across uh, the nation and their people are everywhere it's just a question of galvanizing them is the question of the leaders you know coming out of their slumber and they seem to have you know lost hope it seems so some dynamic that's required. uh thank you madam thank you, thank you. Uh, so the much. next thank you thank you next person is uh, kaisar abbas yes uh, thank you uh, shabnam saheb for your wonderful presentation it's nice to know that there is a resistance going on in india but as you know as we have seen in some other areas resistance is not as successful if you have some preconditions like they should be well organized uh there should be a plan strategies what to do when they are successful what's the next plan and also there is a ideological commitment uh over these uh movements so what's your opinion about it well you are right there is uh, nobody can contest that so it has to be organized it has to have a future plan and that can happen with big movements the civil society there has been as i said there has been a major major attack on civil society so whoever is fighting is fighting with a lot of difficulty uh, the nrc ca campaign was huge if uh, covid was not there it would have become bigger but uh, the only hope which we are getting is from the farmers protest and they are extremely organized i mean it is it is for two months they have been sitting on borders and when you go there you realize that they to the last detail everything is planned there it is not a haphazard campaign and, and farmers campaigns and farmers movements have changed the face of this country many a times i mean they fought in 1985 
they fought in 1947 so we mm-hmm. are quite hopeful that yeah. this would probably do you see a- any ideological base that can unite different communities across religions and communities um and languages across india that can be only on the basis of the indian constitution and uh, that as i said that you know i mean the conviction in that constitution and the conviction in the idea of india which has to be secular and democratic and plural and diverse that conviction has become weaker over the last few decades because of the kind of hatred and communal politics that has been played in this country so you know they have taken 40 years to uh finish whatever modern and uh, beautiful in this country it is not going to be reversed in uh, in 2 or 5 or 6 years even if they are politically defeated the kind of uh, dismantling which they have done it will take any new government 10 years at least to put the put everything in back in place and also to work on the ideological basis and the and on the mindsets of the people thank you madam thank you uh, thank, you. thank you madam there are two more questions and then we will wrap up um, anwar nasim saab and then rashid motala saab and we will wrap up uh, with uh, dr raziz comment go ahead anwar nasim saab Uh, let's see if he's still there. Yes, he is there. You are unmuted. Please go ahead. And uh, uh, Rashid Motala Saab. In the meantime, if he is uh, getting ready, Rashid Saab. Do you want me to speak now, or did, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Rashid Saab. Okay, I am an ex-South African. and we lived under the scourge of apartheid for many decades and then we found that international solidarity movements united with the south african populace and an international boycott was instituted against the government of south africa this culminated in the apartheid state being dismantled and the first election in 1994 when nelson mandela returned to the presidency as the first black president of south africa my question to shabnam ji is is there any role for an international boycott of modi government or will that hurt the local populace more than it will hurt the government of modi sir very much very much and in fact we have very often discussed that that an international uh international movement and international support to the resistance here is very much required um see the difference between when south africa was fighting the apartheid government and now is that most of the world has gone right wing fortunately mm-hmm. things are going to change in the us what you saw on the capitol hill we have been seeing it for decades in india now it might not be you know government uh, building which has been attacked but whether it was babri mosque or what anyway let me not get into that but i'm saying that because the scenario at the international level has become very different now so it is very difficult to have uh, nations and political leaders who would take a stand against uh, the fascist government in india for a long time majority of the people refuse to even accept that there is something wrong happening in india because they were seeing india as a market and as a place where they wanted to invest it is only during the last 2 to 2 and a half years that it has been now recognized internationally that there is a serious problem and serious political problem in india and i think there is A, a very big role with the with the diaspora and other friends can play is to uh, take the reality of india to various human right organizations to political leaders to members of parliament and over a period of time you know grow those solidarities 
who can take a stand against what's happening thank you madam and uh, anwar naseem saab are you there i think he he is expressing but somehow something is wrong he okay is... so let's move on and uh, i have been suggested by someone that uh, madam shireen if she is there she can have some comments or question thank um, you so much um uh, this is shireen from peace vigil south africa um i think partly my question was already asked by mr motala he's also from south africa and we are very worried what is happening in india we can see the parallels with apartheid south africa but i'd like to just like to say that uh, shabnam ji we are very proud of you and of all the indian activists who are working so hard sacrificing their lives also and um, braving uh, this very very fascist government i would also like to just point out that you know people in the diaspora even though they mean well uh, there's a tendency uh, to always highlight what is wrong with the activists in india and i don't mean the political parties but activists sure. who are really fighting on the streets so i think as diaspora we should probably be asking uh, you know some of the things that you raised just now in terms of you know the actual stuff that we can do to help from outside because we are not there we are we are not facing the kind of situation that you are facing and it's a very tough situation so if you have any concrete suggestions uh, uh, for the diaspora uh, apart from of course you know staging uh, protests and writing to uh, to our senators and so on i would appreciate it very much and once again i really thank you for the frontline work that you all are doing we have no right to sit Uh, in our you know safe environments and criticize our our activists who are really doing a fabulous job thank you thank you much thank you very much well i think advocacy is a very very important uh, task which needs to be done because you know i uh, about a few years ago i had gone to uh, somebody had invited me to brief the european union and i met about uh, Ten, twelve different member of parliaments from different uh, countries, and I found that they were absolutely unaware of the reality of India. So I think that it is very important for the diaspora, whoever is you know has that access, to do the advocacy work to tell the world what is happening in the country. And the second very important work is to stop their funding, because most of the right wing. is being funded uh, by organizations from us canada australia uh, and uk i don't know about south africa south africa also has a chain of the right wing organizations i have been to south africa twice and i you know i uh, was in a program where i realized that the people in the indian diaspora were quite quite right wing rss followers so they also need to be uh, identified there because what the governments of different countries are not realizing that these are forces of hatred and if they are spreading hatred in india they are also spreading hatred in your countries so if hatred has to be curbed it has to be curbed everywhere and it is very important to identify uh, these organizations in various countries And thank you thank you shabnam ji and uh, i do have a last uh, comment and then razi bhai will uh, wrap up so uh, madam shabnam so i see there is a huge disconnect between the resistance and the popular government and of course hope is the essence of human being and people just live because of the hope there should be a hope but to expand upon what dr fazal khan already said that modi government is very popular and uh, i was seeing the numbers at 1.93.5% people in march of 2020 say this is the best government and after a couple of months it was 80% maybe this is because of uh, the movement ca so 
the point is that modi government is very popular and people think he is one of the best prime minister we ever had and this is the same situation here among indian diaspora those uh, if you see them all of the intelligent educated people are pro uh, trump of course there is a resistance and there are people who are against his policies and i have seen like you have seen uh, so many protests all over the world and i am really not a very fond person of the protest because i have seen the million uh, million people march and nothing happening so there is some disconnect and i am really don't think that you just protest of course this is your voice and you are entitled to have a voice against government but governments are very powerful and they can crush any movement they did uh, crush ca at least for the time being and now for the farmers movement they are also thinking okay they say this is a khalistani movement and all those kind of and then they will sow the discord among these people and there are people bjp farmers those who were speaking against this movement so they they will they are just buying the time and uh, after a couple of months uh, this will also die down so that's only my comment i am um, because as long as even though the 40% to vote uh, for bjp can win the government but popularity is so high 80% so i'm not saying that you should not have any resistance and it is good to have the resistance but i i i am really a realist person and i don't see any a change in government for a near uh, foreseeable future so you don't have to uh, just uh, say anything that's why that's what my no, I, comment I was to, i need to respond yes <laughs> one is that one is that you are relying totally on data supplied by the media which is controlled by them there is 80% of these people do not think that prime minister modi is the best prime minister these surveys are done on telephone and majority of india does not have those telephones secondly these bjp farmers which you are talking about they had to cancel all their campaigns this is only on times now probably that they are going to cancel their campaigns because the farmers are not letting them enter the villages and even the leaders of bjp have been driven out from various they had to cancel their meetings in various states and various places so while yes they are in power they might come back in power but that does not mean that 90% of india supports them it doesn't it really doesn't and protests have a major role to play because if there were no protest we wouldn't have been uh, able to defeat the british empire it was because there were protests across india because lakhs of people joined those protests that british empire was defeated and one day this regime will also be defeated might not happen in our lifetime but they will be. yeah but uh, uh, i don't I think uh, that's a right the example government. for the movement of indian independence movement was uh, almost uh, all over the india these are but anyway razi bhai please go ahead and uh, wrap it up all right <laughs> so uh, people have opinions and of course they have observations uh but you see uh, when once a system a democratic system is such our society is such that you have all the freedom to express whether this expression goes in the negative direction or the positive direction we have seen in four years how trump has ruined this country and its long lasting effects is not going to be finished just after he leaves and we are going to see it and same thing has happened in india so here in 4 years a highly advanced society can get poisonous and in 70 years what rss with extreme discipline and hard work has achieved is not going to be finished so soon however just to say that a strong uh, resistance is not there uh, it's up to people of india to see some people don't see that much some people see very much there is a hope on the street 
in every corner of India on, with journalists, with artists and masses, they are doing it. But it will take time. Also, the COVID has created a situation where a lot of Western governments have not been able to do certain pressure on India. Now, and Trump, four-year Trump's partnership with Modi has created a situation. Now, the Biden team, most likely, with Kamala Harris and at least six uh, Indian congressmen and women, they are so strongly anti-Modi. They are really known strong anti-Modi. And with Biden commitment on human rights and other issues, there will be a little change. There will be some change. There will be maybe more change. In the pressure works, demonstrations work, but it has to be. Our job in the, as a diaspora is to really extend our hand. We do not know from outside what we can do, but we certainly can do certain things. And we would like to know um, what we can do. Uh, I have offered to Sandeep Pandey, to Harsh Mandar and others, that why you uh, guys don't have a think tank type situation in India. I mean, uh, we have so many think tanks and we know the pressure of these things think tanks here, they really create policy, you know, influence the uh, policies and create a, a, a real pressure. But in India, we don't have think tanks. So these big names and activists, they are so brilliant and so courageous. They can come together. We can finance, we can at least donate money. We can put their cases here. They can write big articles in New York Times, Washington Post, or in Hindu or whatever places. They can we can create as a in a partnership situation to influence. Uh, I mean, not merely talks and go to Saturdays and again just another talk, but these talks can create partnerships also. That can people can come together to do positive change in India as well here within people. There are a lot of Indians here who are really. The diaspora groups are very common, but there are also very secular diaspora groups. They are less in number, but they are very strong. But they need also partners. 